Hey, welcome to episode 2 of the Volvo 142 Turbo Series. Today, let's build the new engine. The last engine failed miserably, and for some reason we're going to put yet another Volvo 4-cylinder back into it. I got this B230F block back from the machine shop over a year ago, but I'm just now getting around to rebuilding it. It was originally a naturally aspirated engine, so it probably had a pretty easy life up to now. I had the shop bore the cylinders to 95.5mm for a set of Yoshifab forged pistons. The crank was within spec, so it was just polished, and I'll be using standard size bearings. A pretty simple build, really, but it should easily support 400 horsepower. The first thing to do is drop the crank into the block. With everything cleaned up, the upper half of the main bearings can be put in. You can see here that the larger thrust bearing is at the back of the engine, which is what you want if you're building a performance-oriented B230. This thrust bearing design is a full 360 degree bearing as opposed to the earlier 180 degree version that had the thrust bearing in the center of the crankshaft. This later engine also comes with stronger rods, but that's irrelevant for us. Still, an 89 or newer non-turbo block is probably the best starting point for what we're doing. On that note, what are we doing? To be honest, I don't really know. This car, a 142 with good suspension, was really fun to throw around when it had 100 horsepower. It was very fun to throw around when it had about 300 horsepower with the 8 valve B23. It doesn't need any more than that, but I've always wanted to build a more proper turbo four-cylinder that can reliably make decent power. So I guess that's what this is. I just want to build a cool engine and I happen to have a car that needs one. We know the crank is within spec, but to double check the actual main bearing radial clearance, we'll use green plastic gauge. We're hoping to see somewhere between 15 and 20 thousandths. After torquing the main bolts to 80 foot-pounds and then removing them, you can just barely see where the plastic gauge was compressed between the bearing and the crank surface. Comparing the width of this to the chart tells us that we're somewhere around 17 to 18 thousandths, which is right about where I'd expect for a polished crank and new bearings. It's a little easier to see on the other halves of the bearings. Now we can clean the plastic gauge off and install the crank with plenty of assembly lube. Assembly lube is absolutely necessary when putting a fresh engine together. If you put these parts together with just engine oil, most of it would drain out in the time between assembling it and the first start. Since I know it's going to be quite a while before this engine will run, I'm using this Permatex stuff which is really sticky and should stay put. The only spec I could find for the main bearing bolts is 80 foot-pounds. I'm torquing them to 40 foot-pounds, then checking that the crank still rotates smoothly, and finishing them to 80. Another cool thing about this engine is that it has oil squirters. These squirt oil up into the bottom of the pistons to help with cooling and wrist pin lubrication. Unfortunately, mine are sitting in the cart when they should have been installed before the crank. After a bit of a struggle, they're all in and ready to go. The last thing to do with the crank is measure the axial clearance or end play. This is just the clearance between the thrust bearing and the crank. Looks like the test indicator is reading around 3 thousandths which is right at the tight end of the range and ideal for a fresh rebuild. Like I said earlier, this block will be getting Yoshifab pistons and rods. I bought these several years ago so some surface rust has gotten to the rods but the bearing surfaces look clean. This rod and piston combo should be fairly bulletproof for this engine. Since it's been so long since these came back from the machine shop, I want to double check that they've been balanced. That just means weighing them to see how close they are. 
I think that one gram deviation is totally acceptable and that tells me that these pistons are matched with the correct rods, so I'll keep them in their respective pairs. This next process may be why I've been putting off building this thing for so long. Filing rings is one of the most tedious, boring things you can do, but there's no way around it. The ring gap has to be big enough so the ring ends don't touch each other with thermal expansion, and small enough to not allow too much combustion gases through them. To measure the gap, we need to put the ring into the bore and it has to be perfectly square. I found that a piston with a ring makes a pretty good repeatable jig for this. Once we confirm with the feeler gauge that the gap is too small, we begin the arduous process of filing material off the ring with this tool. This is just a manual ring filer from Harbor Freight. There are much more expensive electric ring filers to be had, but if you're only building an engine every once in a while, I don't see the reason to spend that kind of money. Not wanting to take off too much, we repeat this process about a million times per ring, all while being sure that the gap stays square and removing any burrs. There are four rings to be filed for each piston. It really is the most boring thing ever. Even Roscoe thinks this is an absurd way to spend a Saturday morning. But eventually we're left with the proper ring gap. Based on the piston manufacturer's spec sheet, that's 25 thousandths for the top two rings and 15 thousandths for the oil rings at the bottom of the piston. Now we just have to put all four of our gap rings onto each piston. The three-piece oil ring at the bottom is a bit fussy, but overall this is a pretty simple job. And it's nice to know we won't be filing any more rings for a while. The wrist pin is next and slides through the piston and rod easily. Two circular wire clips hold the pin in place. We're numbering the pistons because each set of rings is gapped specifically to a particular cylinder. Mixing them up at this point would probably mean that all our ring gaps are slightly off. The properly gapped rings need to be aligned so none of the gaps are near each other and doused with a healthy coat of engine oil. At this point the ring compressor goes on to allow the whole piston assembly to fit into the cylinder bore. Before the rod can be attached to the cylinder, obviously the rod cap gets removed and half of the rod bearing is installed. With some more engine oil on the cylinder wall, the piston ring compressor does its job perfectly and allows the whole assembly to slide into the cylinder. From the bottom of the engine, we can now access the rod and install the bearings, again with a bunch of assembly lube. Rods in their caps are always a matched pair, and I almost blew it by rubbing the markings off some of them while cleaning. Luckily it was obvious enough the way they went together, and I caught the mistake before it became costly. With these rods, Yoshifab supplies ARP rod bolts and a packet of ARP grease. The instructions are very specific about the use of this grease to obtain an accurate torque reading. 
The professional way to install these bolts would be to measure the stretch as you tighten them, but I like the tools for that, so we're just torquing these to 55 foot-pounds per ARP specs. Back on the top side of the block, I found that the pistons are about 18 thousandths proud of the deck. I had the shop skim the deck to clean it up, so I knew this was a possibility, but I didn't think it would be this pronounced. A stock compressed head gasket is 47 thousandths, so it is possible that I'll run into some valve clearance issues. When the head goes on, I'll have to take some more measurements. If anyone watching this has built a 16 valve B230 lately, I'd be really curious to know what the deck clearance was. The rotating assembly is in, but there's still a lot to do. Core plugs, for instance. If you've ever had one of these pop out, you know how annoying it can be to try and reinstall a plug with the engine in the car. That happened with my old engine, so we're taking all the precautions we can this time. First, these are OEM Volvo core plugs, so the fit should be perfect. Also, we're using Vibratite sealant specifically designed for core plugs. I'm sure it's not just blue Loctite rebranded as a specialized product. To install them, we just tap them in with a big socket, 27 millimeter, I think. I just want to get them flush with the block surface or just below. A keen observer may notice three threaded holes around each plug. These are for some retainers that I bought from Zelig's garage years ago and have since lost. If I can't find them, I'll be buying another set because like I said, losing a core plug sucks. Because this is a non-turbo block, it didn't have some of the things that turbos need, like an oil feed and return. I drilled out this blank boss on the block and tapped it with 3 quarter MPG threads. Now I can simply thread in a dash 10 fitting and make the oil return as simple as possible. The oil feed would normally be here, but I'm not going to use it. I really don't want to deal with cleaning all the metal chips out of the oil galleries. Instead we'll use either this plug in the front of the engine, or the port for the stock oil pressure gauge. While I was pondering my next move, a package from Yoshifab showed up. Some brand new ARP head studs. These are similar to the studs for an 8-valve B230, but three of them on the intake side are much shorter. Since we plan on throwing a bunch of boost at this engine, head studs should be a good upgrade over the stock bolts. The B234 head is still at the machine shop, so obviously we can't fully install these studs. Any amount of progress makes me feel good though, so I'm threading these into the block anyway. I think the last internal engine piece we need to install is the oil pump. I mentioned in a previous video that this is a Melling M181 pump that has taller gears for higher oil volume than the stock non-turbo pump. Since the new engine has oil squirters and 16 hydraulic lifters to worry about, the increased volume will be nice. This one has also been modified to fit into the B20 pan we'll be using. The pickup was just cut and welded to be shorter. Unfortunately, the first test fit shows some interference that needs to be addressed. The pump housing is contacting or dangerously close to contacting the crankshaft. This would obviously be terrible if it happened at high revs, so we're going to just file some material off the pump. The V230 pump pulls oil through its pickup, then pressurizes a short metal tube that leads to the main oil gallery. These o-rings have been known to blow out at higher pressures, leading to a drop in oil pressure and possible engine failure. We're using OEM Volvo o-rings to help avoid that. The black hose that gets secured by this bracket is the oil drain hose from the stock crankcase breather box. I'm not sure if we'll even use that breather box because I don't think it'll fit under the new intake manifold, but either way the hose needs to be there to enable oil to drain back into the sump from whatever breather system we use. With everything assembled, it looks like there's about 45 thousandths between the pump housing and the crankshaft, which seems totally fine to me. 
I don't think the timing cover is accurately named because it doesn't really cover up any timing components. Still, we're putting it on in the name of progress and to further seal things up and make the engine less likely to get dusty in my garage. The front main and intermediate shaft seals in this cover are not OEM Volvo and I have a feeling that will come back to haunt me. I think they're L-ring seals, but I can't bring myself to throw away brand new parts that were in the cover when I got it. This solid steel pin is sold by IPD and replaces the much weaker roll pin that Volvo used to index the auxiliary in cam gears. Cheap insurance that we won't shear a pin and destroy the engine. We may destroy it some other way, but it's not going to be because of a roll pin. The auxiliary gear we're using is from the B234 and is much wider than the 8-valve B230 gear to accommodate the wider 16-valve belt. I used some blue Loctite on this bolt because 4-cylinder engines like to vibrate all their fasteners out, then torqued it to approximately 3 Ugga Duggas. This is the crank gear and it's another non-standard part needed to convert a B230 to a 16-valve. Yoshifab makes this billet crank gear and it's much stronger than the stock one, and again, wider than the 8-valve variant. It also uses a Woodruff key instead of a keyway cast into the stock gear. This engine will get a stock B230 harmonic balancer to help damp the 4-cylinder vibes. I got this one from KL Racing in Sweden, and it already had a notch for the Woodruff key milled into it. Once the crank is held in place, the bolt can be torqued to 45 foot-pounds, then an additional 60 degrees. I don't know what that 60 degrees translates to in foot-pounds, but it was more than my impact driver could handle. So I think that's about it for now. I'd say this engine is about 70% complete, so in the next Volvo episode, we'll put the rebuilt head on it, hang all the intake and exhaust and turbo stuff on there. Depending on how things go, maybe we'll even get it back in the car. Like and subscribe if you're into all that, and thanks for watching.